and I uh, want to invite up uh, Colin and Aljit and Armando, uh, Bill, uh, Doreen, and, uh, and Andrew to come on back up. And we'll put six chairs up here. So we'll just scoop these a little closer together. So the goal of this panel discussion is to uh, get a chance to hear from investors. And so some of the themes we want to talk about is how they've set themselves up. This is kind of a reverse pitch. Uh, tomorrow we get to hear from 18 companies presenting and hearing their pitch. Uh, here we get to hear from, from six investors, and we get to hear their pitch of what they're looking for, how they've structured themselves, uh, why they've set themselves up in the way they have, how much passive investing they're doing, how much active, um, what makes a good investment thesis, what makes a good opportunity, uh, some red flags, what turns them on, what turns them off, and uh, what, uh, what have been the benefits of syndicating and bringing deals together. So some of the topics... Uh, not everybody up here is a family office, but we're all investors, and so we'll get a chance. And we see family office as a pretty big, broad term um, that revolves around direct investing, private investing, so it's just a good chance to hear people's personal stories about how they've set themselves up as an investor, why they invest, uh, what's important to them as an investor, and uh, maybe get a thought or two if they have not yet set up a family office, kind of they're just get their thoughts on the content today and what they think about that as, a, as an idea. We do a lot of syndication amongst angel groups, and so now it's an opportunity to try and generate some more uh, angel investor interaction with family offices, trying to help that due diligence, that screening, all those types of things. So uh, we'll get it started off with just some uh, introductions from the new folks that are with us here. Uh, so if you could each take a, a couple minutes just to uh, run through a little bit of your background and, and how you're set up, and, uh, and a thought or two about how you like what you like. So Aljit, I came over from Philadelphia, one of our members there. Thank you so much for coming over and love to have you get started. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Aljit Joy, and I've been uh, an active investor through Kuritsu and a few other angel groups in Philadelphia over the last three years. But my background has been primarily in technology. Um, used to work for a small regional cable company in Philadelphia called Comcast and uh, used to run innovations for them as a senior vice president in Palo Alto, Philly, Israel, and Denver. And so since with that background, I do a lot of investment around technology, but also do a fair amount of work in uh, real estate, uh, which is kind of was a non-conflicting area for us me when I was in Comcast, so I kind of started that off a few years ago, and also do a fair amount of co-investing with Kuritsa folks in the life science and biotech space in Philadelphia. Thanks, Alger. Go ahead, Hi, I'm Armando Pateri. So, uh, I have been involved in early stage technology investing uh, for a very, very long time. I've started a number of companies. I've probably raised some $200 million from my own startups uh, over various rounds, over various years, starting back in the days when I had hair. I am, uh, I am a Koretsu uh, Bay Area chapter member. I'm also the chair for the AI special interest group and do run a company that specializes in AI software development, so I very much uh, uh, resonated with some of the things that were spoken about before. I, I do think that AI is a fundamentally transformative technology the way the internet was back, back in the 90s. Thanks, Armando. Yeah. I'm Bill Corey, and uh, I grew up in Southside Chicago, came out to the Silicon Valley after I graduated from school, and uh, my first boss was Alan Sugar, and uh, he we sat around making disk drives that were bigger than washing machines that had 300 megabytes. Not, we never did understand how they worked. We knew how to make them, but we never figured out why. Um, and I worked for Allen for three or four companies. We took it public and, uh, and then transitioned over and uh, went to work for some other companies in the Valley, basically computer-based and uh, telecommunications-based, and uh, got involved in um, early, early funding. Uh, my next door neighbor started a company called Y Combinator. And back in the days, we would go and listen to lots and lots of presentations and uh, invest small quantities of money. And about four or five years ago, it changed dramatically. And a lot of new money, an incredible influx of money, and the game changed totally. Uh, I got out of it and uh, retired again and moved down uh, to Scottsdale. 
and it was too much to travel to the Bay Area, so I exited all of those early companies. Uh, I think I met Armando at an Angel Capital Association meeting. Uh, We're now neighbors. <laughs> I invest in things that interest me. Um, sometimes he calls me up and says, ooh, 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 and I give a check. <laughs> and sometimes I do diligence and look at things. I actually am impressed with Koretsu. They haven't gotten my money yet, but I do think they are the most transparent and the most rigorous process due diligence group out there. And I've looked at a lot of them. Uh, I, what's next for me, I'm invested in a quarter of the companies presenting tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but what's actually next for me is that I'm actually uh, doing something that a lot of you guys would not like. It's zero return on purchasing large blocks of land in Colorado and uh, turning that into Nature Conservancy uh, bridges for other. Hi, my name is Doreen Benson, and I am here today to talk about <laughs> how I cut my teeth at Xerox Corporation Marketing, and that was probably some really good foundational experience for me. And then I transitioned to Wall Street. I started off at Merrill Lynch as a producing broker. Very interesting days. And then I proceeded from there to Lehman Brothers. And um, from there, as a producing broker, I ended up managing a small mid-cap fund for them. And uh, we, you know, in some pretty rocky markets, we did, we managed to outperform our benchmarks. So that's what we were always looking for. And we did that. And then um, from there, I created my own private equity firm. And what we pride ourselves on is looking for investment opportunity that many times gets overlooked by the large institutions. And where there's, you know, strong viability, but nobody ever really talks about it. And there's many areas where that happens. So anyway, that's what I'm here to talk about today. Hey, sorry. Good call. Hi, I'm uh, Colin Wallace. Yeah, turn on, Colin. Hey, there we go. Uh, I'm Colin Wallace. Uh, I am a serial uh, investor uh, by nature. Uh, I. I actually work for Xerox and IBM and ITT uh, outside of this country, and by all three, uh, in a very friendly way, was told I was fundamentally unemployable and uh, that I need to become an entrepreneur and you should go to work. So uh, I took that advice after a great education with three really great companies uh, and immigrated to the U.S. here in Seattle, actually originally to Spokane, Washington in 1980. Those are the days where you actually had to buy a business, go back to your home country, hire yourself on an L1 visa, come in to manage the business. If I'd have known about the southern border, I'd have shot down there in a heartbeat. <laughs> so so I, I, I started uh, in uh, Spokane, Washington, uh, by the way, I was told to go there by the U.S. government, not my choice. Uh, and uh, I didn't even know where to find the place, it took me days. Uh, no GPS back then. So uh, uh, I started uh, with an uh, auto repair company in Spokane, Washington. Uh, eventually migrated that uh, over to Seattle. It was a company known as 60 Minute Tune, did fast tune-ups. And a company called Minute Loop did fast lube oil filter business. Uh, fast forward to that, did a, accomplished a merger where we took control and became precision tuned and ended up with about a thousand operating units nationwide. Uh, brought uh, a Canadian company down who I partnered with in real estate in that uh, auto business, uh, in the auto glass business. So then I got into the auto glass business and developed their uh, nationwide footprint uh, with about 880 locations that we spread across the uh, U.S. on a joint venture and then sold that. Uh, subsequently, got involved in the coffee business because I'm in Seattle and you had to have coffee and put a group together that uh, basically acquired 80% of Seattle's best coffee and we rolled that out nationwide both on the retail and predominantly on the wholesale side and then ultimately sold that to Starbucks. Uh, then I got into the cell phone business and uh, entered into a partnership where we operate still today as Costco Mobile. We are uh, the cell phone provider that is inside all of the Costco stores nationwide. 
and also the cell phone provider in all of the U.S. military bases around the country. Uh, still operating as a, well, not operating, but still a partner in that company. Uh, got into the internet uh, wireless uh, business, uh, developed a company called TrueConnect, uh, still operating today uh, in the business of selling uh, prepaid wireless under the brand of Walmart Internet on the Go uh, in all of the Walmart stores across the country. So uh, the one common denominator uh, with all of that is that uh, that's a lot of different industries to try and figure out at any one lifetime. So it really forced me into co-investing. And so right from the very beginning, with the exception of the auto repair business, I always put syndicates together of partners or relationships, and these partners sometimes were corporations, that I would bring together to uh, bring the expert knowledge necessary to be in the auto glass business. I mean, heck, when I got in the coffee business, I really didn't even know that coffee came from a bean on a tree. I thought it was just like a little nut you found somewhere, right? Um, so, in each one of those, and I continue to do that. So, in my first, when I first my, sold my first company in, uh, in Seattle here, I began angel investing in 1989 and did so. Uh, over multiple transactions, and really carried through the, uh, the, the feeling that uh, every time I got into a business that I needed to have a co-investment partner or a co-knowledge partner who was an expert in that particular field, be it coffee or glass or cell phones, uh, and have done that pretty much my whole career. So uh, I formed a company in 1989 after the sale of my uh, tune-up company called Lionheart Holdings. That, in 1989, was the genesis of what is technically a family office. Uh, uh, that subsequently has morphed over the, over the decades uh, where we created a trust, and that's now part uh, of the trust. But the holding company is still Lionheart Holdings. Uh, under that, we you know, have expanded. Uh, rather than giving uh, money to brokers to trade our uh, money and lose it, we thought we'd enjoy losing it ourselves better. So uh, formed a trading company that operates out of uh, Nevada, which uh, in involves a, a very sophisticated algorithm uh, system that is uh, not quite as strong as uh, Mark's uh, pattern system, but still fundamentally able to operate as a sort of fully automated trading system. Um, and now in, uh, in actively involved in real estate, uh, up and down uh, the western uh, United States, uh, again with syndicated people who know what they're doing, in renovating uh, apartment buildings, uh, I think we own some in Renton, some in Auburn, uh, some in Nevada, some in Northern California, some in Southern California, and now just recently moved into real estate and new real apartment development uh, following the kind of a Google technology boom in, uh, in the Southern California market looking for uh, uh, affordable housing. So uh, that's what I do, and uh, you know that family office has, a bur uh, has emerged. It's still the original uh, holding company. Underneath that are just a series of partnerships. Pretty much every partnership we get into is a new corporation, the sub S or C or LLC, and uh, and just somehow formed a family office without really knowing we were forming a family office. All so, right, that's me. Thanks, Colin. Uh, Colin gets 48 hours in every day for, for our 24, I think. So uh, we look forward to learning more about that, that secret. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, I got a chance to meet Colin back when I was just getting started back in 2000. And uh, just terrific to have him here. Just a marketing genius over his time period. And uh, very excited to uh, support what he's involved with now. Thanks for being here, Colin. Uh, we got to hear from Andrew uh, earlier today. For those of you who are brand new, uh, Andrew, maybe introduce yourself for a couple minutes and then let's uh, jump to the topic of kind of direct investing structures for uh, investing. You know, you've got your passive structure versus your active structure. And the one question I love the panel to address is if you could go back and if you could make one thing that you would have done a little different with your direct investing structure when you started to where you are today and what you know, uh, what would that have been? Go ahead, Andrew. So I guess my, my, my niche um, over the years um, has been working with 
other family offices that had their own products um, and were looking for co-investors. What, what I liked about that was we knew the underlying family had their own skin in the game and um, our agendas were aligned versus allocating to other you know, products where it was uh, our agendas were aligned but not in, in a in a way when we co-invest with other uh, with other families and uh, again going back to why I initially started family office networks was to give access to families from all over access to good deal flow access to good products and access to be able to co-invest with other families so for my family office we always look for products that are either proprietary products of a family office or ones that they have a vested interest. And over the years, looking back, that's probably where we've had the most success, whether it's investing for ourselves or for raising money for other, um, uh, other products. Great, thanks Andrew, and uh, love for anybody else to jump in there on, on the question. Sure. So, uh, i turn the thing on. No. Hello. Uh, so, I've been both a direct investor in a number of companies. I've also built, been an LP in a number of VC funds because I, I raised a bunch of rounds with various VCs. I get the opportunity to be able to participate as an individual in, into these funds. And my direct investors are wildly outperformed my LP investments. And in fact, uh, dirty little secret is that actually over the long run, the research shows that direct investment will do at least as well as passively investing in, I'm talking about the te technology sector, into VC funds. And I think the there is a fundamental shift that's been happening for many, many, many years now that uh, uh, venture capitalists have largely abandoned the early stage investment opportunities and they've gone further and further and larger and larger and larger. So last year was an all-time herald year, over $100 billion invested in US companies by venture capital firms. Oh my God, that's a big number. However, if you really pick the number apart, it was a very small number of deals. The number of deals uh, for early, uh, historically, the bulk of those deals would have been early stage deals. That would have been two thirds, maybe three quarters of all the deals. Those, the number of those deals have, is essentially evaporated as the mid-stage and late-stage investments continue at a steady pace with larger and larger amounts of money, which creates a tectonic shift in the opportunity to be able to invest. Because what happened is that it opened up this enormous gap for these relatively early stage companies no longer had organized capital sources. And all of a sudden, into the breach, came all kinds of different organizations. Kretz would be a great example of it. Certainly now there, there are 340, 330 organized angel groups in the United States. Kretz is the first example of a mega angel group that spans multiple continents. You got to, you got to figure that that early stage investment is going to become more and more sophisticated, more and more organized, and more, they're going to, going to be more and more predictive analytics and AI applied to it, et cetera, et cetera. But there is an enormous investment opportunity that's happened there as a result of the VCs abandoning that early stage space. So the, 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 the problem becomes, uh, the metric I gave you before about uh, that his, historically direct investment will at least equal, if not outperform, uh, passive investment as an LP and VC fund. There's one qualifier on that, that it has to be a sophisticated individual investor. And that's that's the remaining big problem, because it is very easy for Bill here to invest in a tech company, because he's started and run tech companies himself. He knows where the pitfalls are. And unless you've sat at the big chair of your own company, you don't, you're not going to get it. But I don't care how many articles you read, you're not going to get what it's like. So you're not going to be able to make good judgment calls about either the, the screening process or the mentoring process, right? 
Um, so as a result, the trick becomes, especially for family offices that are coming from different sectors, say real estate or whatever else it is, what becomes important is to be able to figure out how can I align myself with being a group of advisors, partners, co-syndicate co members, whatever it is, but people from the actual sector that actually understand it. When you do that, that's when you get uh, equivalent to VC returns without having to pay the 220, which obviously uh, uh, diminishes the actual returns because you're paying so much out of the fees. I just want to add a little story. Uh, my first uh, angel capital meeting, I walked in and sat down at the table. There were seven guys there and introduced each other, and they're all doctors. And, and they said, Bravado, we've been doing this for six or seven years. We're real, we invest in lots of deals. And I go, Oh, tell me about some exits. Well, oh, we haven't had an exit yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I switched tables, but, but <laughs> the one thing that Armando said and that I have to emphasize is due diligence is you go off on your own and you may have to feel chemistry, you may see the pitch deck. It's a pitch deck. Actually, a lot of due diligence reports are extended pitch decks. So, uh, the more you take, the more time you take to read through the due diligence, try to really rationalize the business and just make up, even if it's an hour or two of talking it over with somebody uh, and say, does this really make sense? And see what the flags are. Do, do the due diligence or join a group that has professional due diligence where you get a more impartial, remember it's still a pitch deck, but it's going to be a little bit more uh, impartial pitch deck. And, you, and that's key. It's just going back in every analysis I've ever done, I could never have done more due diligence. Thanks, Bill. Any other uh, comments on uh, direct, direct investing structures and, and what you would have hoped you would have done a little earlier on in terms of set yourself up for more success? Well, yeah, uh, every transaction I've ever gotten involved with, I've had some fingerprint on it. And, uh, and, and I think more importantly, uh, every transaction where I was directly involved in the, in the business process or the decision process uh, has been a winner. Almost every transaction where I have not done that has been a loser. So it's been a fairly easy uh, phenomenal for me to figure out, which is get involved. And so uh, I traditionally, as I said earlier, I assumed I know nothing about nothing. I know nothing about the coffee business, the glass business, the phone business, etc. I look for partners that know everything about that. Uh, and I help those partnerships come together in a way that synergistically works for them and for me. But what I bring, uh, on, a, on across the board, what I bring is I bring the ability to see, understand, and capture a paradigm shift in an industry before it's become popular to be recognized that it's in a paradigm shift. I was there for copy when we were all drink, drinking Folgers and Maxwell House and thinking how good that was. Um, you know, I, and, uh, you know, I was there when the first smartphone arrived, and I looked at it and said, this is going to change the world. And it didn't, literally. So that is the common denominator. I'm in a new one right now, in a business that's in storage. You would think, well, where's the paradigm shift in storage? I mean, everybody knows it's an easy uh, money-making business. It's a real estate play. But the reality is, it is in a paradigm shift, and it's in it right now in the very early stages, and I am not the leader. I wasn't Starbucks, we were Seattle's best. The reason we did that is that it's much easier to follow than it is to lead into a paradigm hole. So we let Starbucks make all the mistakes, they did, we learned, and that's how we continue to operate today. So we're in the storage business now with a highly tech-enabled business uh, model that's going to change the dynamics of the storage business as you know it. We basically take the self out of self-storage and make more money doing it, believe it or not. So that business is in a paradigm shift and the key is somebody's got to see that. Somebody's got to be in there and see it. Somebody's got to be directly involved. 
And so I am there in bulk. And like the rest of them, I always knew who was going to buy this company before I started building it. I knew Starbucks was going to buy Seattle's Best. I knew that uh, uh, who was going to buy the Speedy Auto Blast company. And I already know uh, the, the rest of the equation. So I already know who's going to buy this business. So that's the other thing, is that if those combinations are in play, that allows me to get involved early, which I am with Caretsu doing the funding for this company, early stage, eventually in the family office, and then I exit. I'm gone at that point. Three years, five years max, I'm, I'm back at the beach, literally in Miami Beach. Uh, and, uh, and that's my play, and, and that's how it's been working uh, for us on a direct involvement basis. Thanks, Colin. Let's, uh, let's keep it going here with uh, a little bit about what, what we like in the market, you know, any particular great opportunities, areas of opportunity that, uh, that any of our panelists are seeing, and, or any red flags. What are some of the things that, that really turn you off in terms of uh, an opportunity? Let's uh, jump around with a little bit of that. Any particular uh, pet peeves? Or? Well, not surprisingly, I'm going to say AI. Uh, I'm deeply involved in it. I, I gratefully believe that it's one of the real shifts that's going to happen in the world in, in, in fundamental ways um, that are unpredictable at this stage. However, in terms of threats, uh, I think uh, in particular universities and think tanks uh, are not set up to really think through the problems of AI safety. And AI safety is a massive problem because these, these technologies are going to get deployed far ahead of our being able to, to predict the unexpected consequences that happen. And already, in some early deployments of uh, neural net-based, machine learning-based systems, there have been a number of unexpected consequences that uh, were not good, right? Uh, AI systems that turned out to be richly biased. Right? There's lots of these kind of examples, but as, as these systems get deployed more fundamentally into our uh, everyday lives, and uh, with, uh, I think, machine learning techniques in particular are dangerous uh, because uh, the, uh, you really have very little way of being able to figure out uh, what the results were. How, how, the, how the computer went through a decision-making process to be able to say this is the predicted outcome. Since you don't have a lot of understanding how it got there, uh, then that's dangerous, right? So, so I would say greatest single opportunity in terms of technology, or at least in, in the tech field, is AI. Its greatest single threat is also AI. Thanks, and uh, Doreen, you're involved in a totally different market, I think, in terms of investment uh, opportunities. You want to talk a little bit about some of the, the things you guys are looking at? Sure. Um, one of the areas that we're working on now and we're very excited about is the area of fine art. We feel that um, it's a an area that, well, certainly Wall Street never pays any attention to, and I know because I work there, and um, they were not so crazy about the idea of anything, you know, really non-conventional. So, um, so that's one of the things that got me very interested in it because there's so many areas like that that totally get overlooked, um, ignored, and there's plenty of opportunity there. It's a hard asset. We have a currency that's you know built on air, and um, and we're starting to see and hear more and more about that and our fiat currency. So hard assets. We're talking about real estate, different other things such as that. These are hard assets, so you know that's an, that's. I mean, I think about that every single day. So you know, if you think back, what you know, you could go to the grocery store ten years ago and spend a hundred dollars and get a full basket. You spend a hundred dollars now and you get like maybe a bag and a half of something at Whole Foods. Exactly. Maybe so not that Whole much. Foods is one hour. Okay, well, maybe it's not that much at Whole Foods, but I walk away with like a bag and a half, and it's like I spent a hundred bucks. And, but you know, a long time ago, 10 years ago, I would have gotten a lot of stuff. So you know, here we are. There's a, that's a real example of how our money is, you know, taking wings and taking off because it's built on it's fiat currency. So that's why I like hard assets in real estate, definitely um, art, absolutely. And so what we do is we look to um, the 
fine arts sector, we, we work with experts in the area, and we our goal is to, we absolutely, and I never want to in any way discredit this, we absolutely love the work, we love the artists, we love it all, but who we really love is our clients. Uh, we make money for our clients, that's our job, that's our primary goal, and that's it. So that's an area, it's a, it's a place that we enjoy working in, but um, nobody really talks about it that much, so that's what we do. One of the areas, Sorry, go ahead, Algin. Yeah, one of the areas that uh, I look at a lot is the transformation of energy. And if you look at energy, it really hasn't changed in the last 100 years. It generates several hundred miles away, transmitted, loses a lot of energy in the process. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of our energy consumption today is fossil fuels. 60 to 70 percent of energy is wasted after that, too. Uh, it's about 40 percent, 50 percent of the world that does not have 24 hours of energy. So, huge gap in terms of generation, storage, huge wastes into the transmission. So there's a very interesting technology like battery storage that could help us save energy. Uh, there's a lot of startups working in that space. There's a lot of stuff around moving away from the generation far away and transporting it to actually doing generation and consumption at the point of consumption. So on demand, so you're starting to see microgrids a little bit, but uh, you, you'll see a lot of that where our homes will be running on small packs of generators that are not running in fossil fuels very soon. And so the very cool technologies, uh, especially in the Middle East, if you think about it, Dubai has made a claim of having electric vehicles only from 2025 onwards. Every charging station they're putting onto is connected to a long diesel generator that powers 60% of their power. I mean, it, it's just ridiculous when they you know, put an EV station, charging station connected to a big diesel generator somewhere else. It's it just not sustainable, and when somebody said $30 oil, it's going to get pretty bad for that whole region in terms of uh, how energy is consumed, energy is produced. And so a significant area that we I look into in terms of uh, opportunities uh, to the transformation. Thanks, Al. A, a theme you'll, you'll hear as you talk to a lot of family offices is they, they love things like what Dory is doing because it's, it's very specific and having somebody work in that area who manages a passive investment and that kind of thing like art, which most people would not have the ability to do on a correct basis very well. And so there's a lot of terrific uh, alternative passive strategies where there's a really good manager who really is an expert in that area with their team and doing that very, very well. And then there's the direct area, the thing that, that they have an expertise at where they're able to directly add value, which Colin talked about, things like adding value to. So you either want to have a great team and really trust the people that are executing a strategy in an area that you appreciate, you get a good return from, but you're, you're passive versus your active area where you're actively trying to develop opportunities. So thank you guys very much for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, you know syndication and, and kind of the best deals that you guys like to, to be involved with, either actively or passively when it comes to, to syndication. How has that worked well with family offices? Uh, vis a vis you know, institutional investors, VC is kind of some of the more traditional places that uh, angel bank companies have ended up having to go for capital. You want me to take, uh, take a stab at that? Um, um, let me just kind of take a quick step back here. Um, this kind of reminds me of one of the, the first events I did um, maybe about 20 years ago. And um, I had um, I was moderating, I had maybe four or five uh, panelists that were other fund managers and, um, and as I'm talking to the audience, um, I'm trying to think, it's really one of my first events, I'm like, what do I say? And, uh, and um, so I basically, um, I, I came out of Morgan Stanley and um, the first thing I said to the audience, and I remember it very specifically was, when I was at Morgan Stanley, I used to guarantee my clients' returns. And then I would look at everyone's face, and you just say guarantee. And then, for those of you that didn't hear me in the back, when I was at Morgan Stanley, I would guarantee my clients' returns. And what I mean by that is, if they would give me their money, I would guarantee I would lose it I can space it out, I can do it one chunk, I can do it over two years, however it's your life. But the whole point is, these people on the panel, these are the experts. This is why 
you want to invest with them because they are only getting compensated and uh, based on their success and performance versus a mutual fund manager or, or other managers that were getting some type of salary. And so it, it really remind, it reminded me of just uh, um, that one event that I did that really uh, got people uh, um, looking. And uh, um, But going back, again, what made it so compelling was 15, 20 years ago, most investors, when they invested in funds, were not sharing in fees with the underlying um, fund manager. And um, once when hedge funds and other funds came along, it all of a sudden the agendas were tied together. And that's where we've seen a lot of money move into professional money management. We'll open up for questions from the audience here as well. Uh, if any other panelist wants to chime in on that question, feel free to jump in. And again, uh, if we grab a mic runner up here at the front here, we can uh, start getting ready for some questions from the audience. If you have a question, just raise your hand. If uh, Max or Maggie or somebody wants to come on up and grab the mic here. But any other comments from the panel before we jump into Q&A? Here you go, Max. All right, we'll liven it up with some questions from the audience here. If you want to direct your question to any specific person, please uh, please do so, otherwise just for the panel here. Yeah, um, thank you for your presentation, it's good information. For those of you that you uh, have done a fair bit of angel investing, can you talk a little bit about the distribution of your positive returns? Are you getting most of your return for your portfolio from one, two, three companies? Always. Or is it? Always that. Okay, and, and the rest are close to zeros? So you're, you're seeing the same... It, it doesn't matter how... What percentage? I mean, how, how many are losers? Uh, uh, pass the mic around. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing at this. Uh, probably outright losers, 50%. Uh, ones that are okay, uh, probably 35%. And 15% that make up that really make up the difference. And that's what happens. It doesn't matter if you, if you look at this... Uh, for any VC fund, for any pool of investment, it, is, it always winds up on that saying, oh, it's just, it's just the nature of it. And it doesn't matter how smart the manager is, it doesn't matter how, it, it always winds up being some distribution curve. And as a result, when you invest, by all means, invest smart. Do the diligence. Have good, good people around you that know this space. All that stuff is true. The first fine. Quick follow up question. Based on that, considering that your distribution curve for uh, success is similar, how, how, are, how are direct investors able to get better returns than VCs? Is it just a fee that they're not going to pay? Uh, no, what I said is very similar. <laughs> right? uh, over the long run, I bet you want to be similar. And I'll actually, if you're curious, I'll actually look up statistics. Right? I actually looked up the statistics ahead of this uh, to actually to actually model this. I, I think over the long run, it becomes similar with the one caveat that uh, the investment, uh, the screening, the decision, the diligence, and then the ongoing mentoring did involve people people that were actually knowledgeable in the field. With that one caveat, uh, I think over the long run, it's similar, minus the two and 20. Just, just one other thought of that. Uh, most VCs of the public secret on this one, they have to invest in the follow-on rounds. You keep investing in follow-on rounds, your overall multiple is going to be lower. And most early stage investors are not investing in the multiple rounds. So this is a public secret. The reason Silicon Valley firms are that much for returns, if they have to keep investing. However, if they didn't invest, that no one's going to invest in that company. So it's like a it's a double-edged sword for investors. So if you take out the multiple round investing paradigm that's already set in place, you, you, VCs from the early rounds are good making, making great multiples, but the future rounds are not. So, but they have to stay with it, or others are not going to invest. So that's a, one of the big reasons of the multiples. We have a whole also, presentation on that later on today, actually, as well. Also, keep in mind that the uh, the uh, multiples in terms of returns are higher for the early stage companies. The, the exactly the ones that the VCs don't play in. They're all about putting billions of dollars into Lyft, right? 
they're not about finding this cool new company that's raising a million bucks. They don't play in that space at all. That company is the one that's going to have these incredible returns, but they're also companies that are not looking for that much money. So your ability to be able to play a relatively smaller amount of money across a diversified portfolio and have some set of them turn into something awesome is better. You don't need to be playing with billions of dollars. Yeah, go ahead, Brandon. Uh, this question is for Doreen. Doreen, can you talk a little bit more about the fine art that you invest in? I'm so used to writing checks for companies. I haven't thought about investing in fine art through a fund. So is there a particular type of art that you look at? And then how do you diligence uh, that art to make sure uh, it is genuine and is authenticated? Um, that's a couple of questions at once, so yeah. I'm going to just do it this way. We have a team of people that we work with. You may or may know, not know their names. And um, they are in that space. And we work with them. And so they that is their job. That is what they do. And um, they've done it for years. And we work with them. And um, what was the next question? I'm sorry. Well, what types of art? Okay, so we opportunistically buy, so it base, it's based on how we can enter and how we can exit. And it may be, it may be a um, collection, it may be one piece. And so it's all about how well can we buy this. We may love it, if we can't buy it right, we're not getting it. And so it's also about how, what we're planning on doing with that. So if we're gonna hold on to something, we're gonna have all kinds of over, I don't want to hold everything forever. I don't. What I want to do is I want to say, oh, I think we can get it at this price if we can. That's good. And if we can then, just, and I don't like using this word, but dispose of it um, in a way that you know becomes our returns, we're in good shape. So that's what we're looking for. So we always have the end before the beginning, if you know what I'm saying. Thanks, Brianna. Thanks, Dorian. Other questions? There we go. Uh, just a question for Colin. Uh, could you expand a little bit on the storage without the self? Love to hear a little bit more. Um, you're familiar with clutter and uh, make space and uh, and a couple of other also rains that are in the field. About five of them. Right? So um, clutter is, uh, is a business model that uh, basically says, we'll do everything. We pack, uh, we come to your home or your storage unit, we'll pack it all up, we'll identify it, uh, photograph it, RFID it, uh, put it in storage and bring it back on demand whenever you need single item or multiple items. And uh, it's a very uh, interactive uh, way of treating storage versus the old way, which is, well, you know, public storage, by way of example. Uh, here's a company that does 2.6 billion in revenue. Uh, that represents a tiny percentage because the market is a $65 billion market, yet the largest in it only does 2.6 billion. But on that, they net a net margin of 1.5 billion which is kind of an interesting margin. It's more like a software company. And when you look them up, you think, my God, their stock trades at 30 times earnings. So, you know, who are they, Amazon? Uh, no, they're a very simple, you know, drive by every day, never give it a thought, public storage company, right? And the fundamental model they have is, we do nothing, you do everything, and the only thing we do is collect money. That's their model, it's as simple as that. I mean, you gotta find a truck, you gotta find either uh, hire somebody or, or bully somebody into helping you uh, schlep all that stuff into that truck, into your storage unit, and, and then you gotta go back and get it, you roll up that door and it's gonna kind of come fall out at you and you just quietly roll it back down and go home, right? And continue to pay for another several years more until you get tired of it. Um, so that's the model, and that's the kind of money they're making at it. So now flip that, and along comes uh, some innovative companies like Clutter and like MySpace. By the way, Clutter just now collectively got $310 million from Sequoia in a syndicated group from Sequoia. 
Make space got 60 some odd million. And basically what they're saying is, all right, we're going to flip that around. We're going to do everything and, uh, and you do nothing. And so we come, we pack it, we identify it, uh, we do all of that stuff. And they did it, and they're doing it right now. The problem is they're doing it at huge losses. Right? So you can't even imagine the cost logistically of you ordering that water pot back at your house from storage next Thursday, and it shows up like that. You can't even imagine the logistical nightmare of finding it, making, getting it onto a van, getting it dri driven back over to you. The cost is enormous. The business will never make a dime. We tried it for four months, lost money progressively more every month until finally I said, this is a bad business, we're not doing that, right? So we spent the last seven months re-engineering the whole logistics model the whole employee model in terms of the human capital model, which is also a big problem because the clutter models basically operate on the basis of, gee, we got a client, we got to go over to the Home Depot parking lot, throw a logo t-shirt on a couple of guys, throw them in a van and drive them over to your house. Really bad model for the employee because they're $10 an hour day laborers. Terrible model for you, the homeowner, who is in your home, right? And a worse model for the company. How do you manage a employee HR system based on that kind of mentality? So what's going on now is that we, we are, uh, definitely had an opportunity in hindsight to figure out, gee, that doesn't work. Let's reinvent that. So we logistically reinvented the whole business model. Brought technology, which was already uh, being used in, in Clutter and others on the front end, but brought a technology design for the back end that flatlined the employee level by 80% and allowed us to do exactly what they do. And, and in our third year, allowed us to project about an $85 million net EBITDA. Um, the, we solved the human capital problem by going and uh, collaborating with the US military, so we hire experts. Uh, they are experts already in logistics because that's what the military does. 20% of the people in the military are into shooting things, 80% of them are providing the bullets so that they can shoot things, right? So how do you get the bullets there? You need a logistics team to do that, right? So they're all in the logistics business. So we hire them, they're already in the logistics business. They, you know, they show up and it's yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. They I mean, they are got some standard of uh, work ethic that works for them. They're easily managed. Uh, and uh, and so we and we we found a way to pay them not only a living wage because that's hard for them to find coming out of the military at two hundred fifty thousand of them a year coming out of the military getting paid day labor uh, rates because that's all they're worth at this point as a forklift driver or a truck driver uh, and we found a way to pay those 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 teams. Uh, anywhere between seventy to fifty-five thousand a year, plus healthcare, plus four hundred one k, plus stock options, similar to what Starbucks did when everybody said Howard was nuts when he gave that whole package to baristas. Uh, but turned out that was the best the movie ever made. Um, and so that business uh, is about is going in that transition. And so that storage business is about to be reinvented, and that's how it's being. Reinvented. All right, Colin, thank you very much. And you can hear all about it tomorrow as well. Scott, you have a question over there for Daniel? Go ahead. If yeah. anybody else has got a question, we have about five minutes left for questions. So if you have a question, flag Daniel down. Go I Scott. feel bad even stopping Colin. It's such a fascinating, we need to bottle that. Um, I guess there's probably a question, maybe single out Bill, because I noticed you worked at Atari in the early days managing. Well, managing. first wire rack. There you go. The yeah. game from one station to the next. I, and, and so in, in my, my business is about you know, we develop widgets for you know me medical tech and uh, consumer goods for for innovative companies. So I, I'm just curious about perspectives on manufacturing. Where, where do we stand, especially in light of of what Mark Anderson was saying with China uh, being a, maybe less secure? Are, are, are we still is, are we still looking for for deals? Is that a red flag if if we're manufacturing in the U.S. or a red flag if they're manufacturing overseas? Does does that matter? Are there any interesting deals going on in the manufacturing space, or is that just a kind of commodity at this point? 
Well, it's not, it's not a commodity. I think China's getting ready to get beat. I mean, if you want sheet metal, you ought to go to Korea. Uh, if you want to shoot plastics, you're going to go to Japan. The quality of, of mold or Taiwan, which they, they wear out faster. Uh, those are areas where China's had problems. Uh, early Atari days, I mean, we were building units in Sunnyvale, uh, stand-up manufacturing people. Um, and when we moved to Taiwan, um, our manufacturing costs went down from $129 per unit to $32. Um, and we could produce as many. I put eight facilities up between Hong Kong and Taiwan. Built eight clones of the manufacturing process we set up on the Tilda Street in Sunnyvale. And uh, it was running great, and it's amazing. Then when uh, Ben Wong, who is actually the guy who made all Wong's electronics, he used to be able to see his sign when he flew into the old Hong Kong airport. Uh, he went to the University of Michigan, his dad. Uh, he stopped at Atari on the way back to Taiwan, uh, to Hong Kong, and uh, met some people, and we gave him his first purchase requisition. And that's how he made his money, is building Atari games and cloning it, and then moving up to Shenzhen, and then moving north to Shenzhen, um, and with large manufacturing facilities. Um, how has that changed in the last five or six, eight years? We, we tried at a company to bring the product back in printed circuit board technology because there's this balance between high volume and engineering change cost. So if, if your product is stable, you can go to many locations in the world. And I have friends who believe in India. I don't like going to India. It's, it, I've never been able to make a repeatable manufacturing process work to Six Sigma in, in an Indian environment. Uh, have been able to in Vietnam, China, and South Korea. Um, but the cost of engineering support in that environment, if your product has any kind of change, a lot of change activity, justifies an attempt that we made for doing printed circuit boards and product assembly uh, in Arkansas, where you can get skilled technicians for a very reasonable price. And uh, we made that model work. As long as the products were not super high volume retail type sale products and there was a low level of, inst of instability. Uh, at Sun Micro, we had a manufacturing process. We were going to build in northern uh, well, Broomfield. We ended up with only six buildings. But Scott McGinley wanted to put a whole 10,000 person campus there and make that work as a manufacturing facility. What's changing? I, I think that China's costs will go up someday. Their entire model is based upon a class of workers that aren't getting middle the lifestyle wages. And as they become more and more aware of finer things in life, costs go up. So I think that the days of China manufacturing, I would not go there if I was starting a company. I would try to figure out how to make it work. Uh, at a little cost center in Mexico, uh, or uh, in both cost centers in the United States, we try to make it work. Um, one comment: I was in the, the manufacturing facility over this week in Philadelphia for a company that's going to make a super specialty 360 view stereoscopic camera for drones, and they want to make it in the U.S. It's coming from India. The IP is there, but they want to make it here because your customers are the U.S. government, military, aerospace, and uh, a few other industries that are all here. So the comment that the, the manufacturer made is for units that are in the hundreds, maybe up to a thousands per year, it's gonna be here. The precision, it's nine nines uh, in terms of manufacturing quality, you're gonna get that here. Uh, they may get 16 uh, heads up displays, et cetera. When you start going, when you get in the hundreds of thousands, that's China, okay? And they don't wanna even compete in that space. It's just that entire area has been depleted of you know, very good know-how and skills. If you're looking at manufacturing, there are certain industries that will not buy outside of the U.S., so those are the ones you want to stay here, and those are the customers you want to find, and then it's high precision items. Okay, terrific. We've got time for maybe uh, one more question. Again, just a quick reminder to fill out your uh, gold sheets for each of our panelists up here, if you're interested in following up with any of them, learning more about what they're doing. Uh, we've got time for maybe a couple more questions, if we have any. Virginia? Hi, uh, my name is Virginia. I'm an entrepreneur, and um, we're interested in meeting and talking to family offices because often there's um, it's a different investing strategy than with your typical Silicon Valley sort of VC. Um, but 
they're very difficult to find. So I guess I'm just curious on the flip side uh, to hear about your deal flow, how you find deals, what your pipeline looks like, how do you populate that, um, and how do you curate the best opportunities for your family office? Excellent, that's a great question to wrap up with here. So let's get a quick comment from everybody on for us, it's uh, being part of major groups like Renza, where there is both local and global deal flow to come in. We get to see a lot of companies from the Northwest in Philadelphia, so I love Renza for that. I'm also members of other deal, uh, major groups in the local area, and then a lot of a few other family offices. So we there's a, there tends to be a lot of syndication. Uh, even in in uh, Philadelphia, uh, in the, the Mid Atlantic area, we have like eight or nine other groups that we syndicate with local universities. So I think. Uh, Curtis have a very good program around syndication, so deal flow has been very robust. Thanks, Aljay. Other comments from the panel on, yeah. on deal flow? Go ahead, Andrew. Um, sure. Um, we've been very fortunate with, obviously, the growth of the family office industry and space. Um, we have hundreds, not thousands, of different issuers sending us their deals. Um, for family offices to look at, and um, so it's um, you know, we've been very fortunate just to get the inflow of uh, just we'll say good deals, um, uh, good deal flow, and again a lot of that's coming from our existing members. So and a lot of our members are family offices that are either rolling out their own products or have their own money invested in deals and are looking for other co-investors to uh, participate. So that's where we get most of our deal flow from. In addition, um, just word of mouth, we've been doing this, I've been, I've been this over 20 years, um, very good track record. So when you deliver, I, get, I think people find you. And uh, I've been very fortunate. Very Thanks, Virginia. Thanks, Andrew. Any other quick comment? Otherwise, we can uh, wrap up the panel here. So I just want to get a round of applause for all of our. Uh, <laughs>